Thank you, Karina, for reading the scripture. If you would like to be called on to, to perhaps do a reading in the future, just email me or send a Facebook message. We're beginning to utilize the gifts of so many people, and that's really important during this time. So thanks, Karina. Um, I also want to point out that we're our, face, our live stream is on a bit of a delay, so many of the prayer concerns that come in are not there when I'm looking at them, and we, of course, lift all of those comments and are aware of so many that are not spoken or written in this case. And one last thing I'd like to mention, um, there, when we meet in person, there's usually a time for receiving the morning offering. We're not able to do that now, but I wanted to thank everyone who has responded, who is able to respond with generous financial gifts to the church. Uh, during this time, it's particularly important, important, and it's very much appreciated. If you would like to make a donation, I think Robert has just added a link into the comment line uh, that you can use to make an online donation. Or you can just do it the old-fashioned way and mail a check to the church. Over the past couple of months at First Congregational Church, we've been adjusting to a new normal, like all religious communities, like all communities. The past couple of months have been so strange. When we first decided to close this building, and stop meeting in person. We bravely jumped into the world of online church. I remember thinking at the time, oh, this will last for a few weeks and we'll be back to normal by Easter. That was 10 months ago. Oh, it was not 10 months ago. I was distracted for a moment by some technical. It was actually 10 weeks ago. It just seems like 10 months ago. As the shutdown drug on, we began to get more creative. Like every organization in the world, we added Zoom gatherings for small groups and for meetings. We started adding pre-recorded videos in the worship live stream, sometimes more successfully than others. <laughs> We came up with a virtual choir piece by Progressive Harmony. We'll be doing more of those. We hit a few bumps in the road, yes, but now we're sort of in a groove. Most people who want to are able to find the live stream on Sunday mornings on Facebook. People who aren't on Facebook, watch it later. It's posted on the website. We've even started posting a sermon-only version uh, later in the week for people who are, just want to follow the content of the sermon. For the most part, people have figured out how to mute their audio for our many Zoom meetings. For the most part, I should say most people. <laughs> now churches are starting to reopen, along with restaurants and theaters and businesses. There are protocols in place usually, though they are not always enforced. That can be difficult. Our church leadership feels like it's too soon to reopen. We all feel a desire to be able to see the people that we love, to enjoy the activities that we used to enjoy. In the old ways, we used to do that. We miss gathering at church like we used to, having breakfast and handshakes, and hugs. Over the past weeks, we've been thinking about spiritual resiliency. How might a person develop the ability to live from a place of centeredness and strength that is not dependent on outside circumstance? When the world is scary outside, and it is scary outside, is it possible to maintain peace inside? And if it's not possible to be peaceful all the time inside, then can we figure out ways to be just a little less freaked out? Today we're going to continue thinking about resiliency, but in a broader sense. How is resiliency experienced in community? 
can communities, can churches grow in their ability to adapt? I mean, churches are not known for their willingness to embrace change. That, my friends, is an understatement. But can churches be resilient and flexible? And what conditions are needed in order to empower that? Can we look at this time as an opening for our church to address challenges that have been there for a long time? Not only in our church, but in churches in general. The experience of this extended disruption is going to change us in lasting ways, not only as individuals, but as communities. That's inevitable. Once we flatten the curve, we won't just go back to normal. We're living in an entirely new world, whether we like it or not. So what does church look like? in a new reality? What might it look like? The uniqueness of these days has plunged us into the kind of experience that we never would have chosen for ourselves. But there's actually a lot we can learn from it. Since we're stuck with this disruption, we might as well use it as a path for greater understanding. In fact, choosing to use a difficult path, a difficult situation, rather than resist it, is a key characteristic of resiliency in individuals and in communities and organizations. Cameron Trimble is ordained in the United Church of Christ. She founded an organization called Convergence that is dedicated to helping progressive congregations reshape and adapt. She wrote an excellent piece called 10 Ways the Church Will Be Changed by COVID-19. I'm not going to read all 10 of them, though I encourage you to look it up online and and read her observations. They're excellent, I think. I do want to note three of her observations. She says, doing church online is here to stay. Churches like ours have been catapulted into the technological era. It's something we thought we should be doing for a long time, but we never quite got around to it. For now, it's all we've got. And so we've jumped right in, and our ministry is better for it. I'm not saying it's better than meeting face-to-face, but that our new use of technology is a powerful addition to how we do ministry. And now we're able to do it. People who are homebound. I saw Carolyn Crowley uh, log in earlier today. People who are from out of state are able to join worship. I hear stories every week from you about friends who live far away, who now worship with us every Sunday. People who live too far away to visit in person are able to do it online. Every week in the thread, we see comments from people who are joining worship for the first time. We're not going back from this. Churches, including ours, will figure out how to reopen. Yes, we do plan a gradual return to -to face-to-face worship. But now we have this additional capacity to offer our progressive spiritual community to a world that needs it. Second, a lot of churches are going to close. This sad reality is a safe bet. During every major economic disruption in US history, we have seen an acceleration of church closures. Closures, particularly of small, vulnerable churches, were already on the rise. They won't be able to weather the storm, particularly rural or small urban congregations. I think regional denominational offices will continue to struggle too 
as giving decreases in local churches, then the agencies that they fund will decline too. The churches that make it, the churches that even thrive through this time, are those that can adjust to a completely new reality. <clears throat> Pretty much since this church was founded over 100 years ago, we have followed a predictable model of one to two services on a Sunday in which everybody gathers in one place at one time. It's worked well for us in many ways, but that won't work until there's a vaccine, and perhaps even then. We no longer live in a world where we can have one to two services on a Sunday. Indoor gatherings, where people share the same space for any duration, those are the highest risk environment. Churches who realize this and who are able to adapt will figure out how to do church differently, will figure out how to create 25 different worship experiences that help people connect to God. I'm so grateful to our staff and our lay leadership who have jumped into this reality with enthusiasm. Youth are meeting twice a week on Zoom. They use Slack for pictures and conversation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. They deliver cookies. They are about to have watch parties on Netflix. There's a parent community. Children gather on Zoom every Sunday after worship to learn and grow spiritually. They're continuing their series on evolution and making meaning. During the week, they're doing things like gaming together, sharing tips with each other, you know, creative virtual experiences. They read books, they play ukuleles. Those opportunities are there every week and if you or children or youth that you know would like to connect with them, just message the church office and we'll connect you. And it's not only for children and youth. Our church is doing adult ed study series. We've done a journaling series on Facebook. Book club, Soul Sisters, Heart to Heart, Continue Meeting. Rainbow Connection videos put out by staff and members of the congregation are diverse and meaningful. You know, it might be a devotion or a song, reading a book together, an origami project. Every week in staff meetings, we've been meeting weekly, and we throw out ideas for new classes or new ways to engage or just ways to encourage and have fun. Here's the latest idea that I came up with, though no one else is very excited about it except for me. So tell me what you think of this. Wouldn't you like to see short videos about how church staff is dealing with our hair, since most of us aren't going to salons. You know, a FCC COVID hair styling series. Doesn't that sound exciting? That's, that's sure to go viral, I think, right? Our tech team is nodding enthusiastically, suppressing their laughter, or maybe not even suppressing it. Seriously, though, our congregation is rich with talented people teachers and artists and pastors. We, uh, of course, produced our first virtual choir video. And since that time, one, two, three people have come forward in the congregation to, that want to learn more, to be involved with that, so we can do that more often. We're rich with talented people, with teachers and artists and chefs and pastors. We are figuring out ways to support and encourage each other through online offerings. And we're already planning for small group gatherings, face-to-face -face gatherings designed around strict distancing protocols. We have a large, beautiful, open space around our church. These kinds of things are resources that a lot of churches do not have. So it remains to be seen, will we look around at what is available to us and find new ways to be church? 
Here's the third way that Cam Trimble says that churches will change. Younger generations will finally contribute more engaged leadership. You know, for years, councils and boards and cabinets at member organizations, secular and religious, have lamented that they couldn't recruit younger adults to serve on these influential committees. While the younger folks tried to explain, hey, we're working, <laughs> we're raising children, we're trying to have a life, you know, they didn't have time to drive to church and spend hours in endless meetings, especially when those meetings could be handled in 15 minutes online or through email, perhaps. Now, we're all forced into an online meeting space in order to get anything done. And while it's no one's idea of fun, at least not mine, to sit in front of a screen for hours, we're learning that we can get a whole lot done in a focused 30-minute meeting. Meeting online is more congruent with our lifestyle. It's, better, it's a better practice of environmental stewardship, not to use gas to drive in our cars, to come together for face-to-face -face meetings all the time. These things will enable more people to engage in leadership. It's something that you know, we've wanted to incorporate for at least a couple of years, but never could quite make it happen until now. These are just a few of the ways that we're sort of waking up to this whole new world, a whole new church that we're shaping together. Now is the time to be very thoughtful about our next steps. We have the opportunity to address many of the challenges and divisions that have long plagued our, not only our church, but our communities, our world. Because everything about the way we do church has been turned upside down. We have the chance to find a new path that will lead us out of these challenges that churches have known for a long time. We can forge a path together to a more vibrant and inclusive community. Hope is like a path in the countryside. As people walk this way again and again, a path appears. What matters in church right now is that we wake up to our new world and to the possibilities that it offers. It matters that we ask the right questions and engage those questions with creativity and vigor, and that we trust the path will open up ahead of us, despite what seems like limitations now. Actually, the path is already opening up. I hope we don't rush back into the world too soon. Let's take the time together to think about and engage these and other deep questions about the kind of lives we want to live, the kind of churches we want to nurture, the kind of world we want to see. Wouldn't it be a shame for us to waste a global pandemic by failing to learn what it can teach us about being more fully awakened people and creating healthy, sustainable communities? We can create a better church, a better world on the other side of this adventure if we trust the journey enough to let it take us where we need to go. So friends, during the coming week, I pray for all of us to have fresh eyes, creativity, to imagine a world that could be. In the name of our God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, go blessed, friends.